So my name is uh, Mathieu Muller. I'm uh, from France, as you can hear already. Um, I'm field engineer at Unity, and uh, my job is basically to uh, travel uh, mostly in Europe and also in the States uh, to talk with people and answer as many technical questions as possible. So I visit studios and I go to conferences. And uh, lately, since, since uh, GDC, I had many questions about Adam, how so many questions. Uh, probably some of them you ask yourself, was it a hack version of Unity? Um, it's a kind of tradition that we had in the past. Uh, when the asset will be available, that's also the classical one. How long did it take to make it and how many people worked on the project? What is the required configuration? Like, is it, is it a crazy machine with uh, five, four GPUs in parallel? And uh, just simply, how did you do it? And this is the purpose of the talk today. Um, so uh, what is a hacked, uh, what is a, was it a hacked version of Unity? Of course it was, uh, <laughs> because, uh, yeah. Because we, uh, we wanted, like, the, the goal of this demo team is to push as far as possible the, the graphics quality. That's why there is no gameplay or anything. And so we had to, uh, to do a lot of things to get to this quality. But fortunately, um, things got into the trunk, um, most of them into official versions. So, for example, we worked on improving the shading. Like, we, we didn't have the, the right shading equation at the time, uh, which was making actually Unity not behave exactly as the other softwares, like Substance. Um, we uh, improved rendering performances. So we put ourselves constraints, like having a crowd of 120 people render at runtime. So uh, we had to improve a lot of the performances of animation and rendering. Uh, also, the, one of the most important things that we were suffering uh, was uh, aliasing. We had a real problem with aliasing since uh, many years. And, uh, and, and to solve this problem, we needed motion vectors to be implemented inside the engine. So this was actually shipped in 5.4. We also wanted characters with a lot of uh, simulation running on, on them. Uh, one of them is a feather simulation on the back of uh, Sebastian, the, the big guy who, who arrived at the end. Uh, for this, we use uh, instancing that we uh, developed for 5.4 uh, so that it can run at runtime also. Uh, we use also texture arrays. We develop texture arrays, uh, which allows to mix uh, different um, mega scan textures. When will the asset going to be available? Yeah, that's the question. So I don't know if you got it, but uh, the, uh, the answer is today. Um, so it's pretty cool, right? Yeah. Yeah, you can, you can clap. So you just go on the Unity website, and you can, download, um, uh, you can download the executable of the demo. So you can just run it and show it to your friends. Um, so it's not just like running, but you can pause any time and move the camera around. Uh, there, is, there are two packages, one with characters and one with uh, environment, with the indoor and outdoor. And also, you have all the source code of all the volumetric lighting that we are using in Unity, and uh, that I will show today. Uh, how long did it take, and how many people? Eight months in total, two months of pre-production, and four months to, pro to, to deliver the first part of Adam, and two more months to finish the second part that we didn't have time to finish. Um, and, uh, and we were eight people. Two people were working uh, as contractors. Uh, we had some extra contractors to, to be character artists and so on. What is the required configuration? When we ran it in, uh, at GDC at, and at Unite, it was running on a GTX 990. Um, it, it was rendering at real time 30 frames per second, 1440p. And how did you do it? So that's the purpose of the talk today. So what you should be able to do after my talk, uh, if I can make it, uh, is to take publicly available assets uh, that we have now and uh, take an official version of Unity, like 5.4.1 or anything after this, or 5.5. You need at least beta 6 or 7 just to run some of the post effects. And you should be able to recreate one shot of Adam. Um, and. Um, we, we, I will mostly focus on the indoor scene. Uh, I don't have much time. So mostly focus on the indoor scene and on the shot number 14 from the beginning, which is we don't see it very well, but we will see it later on. 
And uh, yeah, and also I will try to just also give details about some other aspects of the productions, which uh, is not indoor. For, uh, to, to go to this point, I will go to different steps. First, going through the assets, setting up the project, and doing the posing of Adam, uh, doing the FX that were used, like the smoke, doing the lighting, post effects. And all this on a MacBook Pro 2014. It's, uh, it's midnight in France, and uh, I hope I can make it. Um, so, uh, the assets. So just to, to, to get an idea, we use mostly 3ds Max, um, a marvelous designer for the, all the closing, which is quite nice to, to make everything which is closed because it simulates a close on, on top of the, uh, on the model. And we did the final sculpting in ZBrush. For texturing, we use mostly Substance Designer. Um, and for the outdoor, we use Megascan from Quixel uh, for, the, for, the for the grass, um, rocks, and concrete. We also use a bullet physics simulation in uh, 3ds Max to, to, to create the broken version of the mask. You know, when he breaks the mask, it's uh, this. And also for the close tearing, when he's tearing the clothes. Uh, what, something which is very, very important. Uh, we were working like these eight people, only two of them were on the same location. Um, different people were making the assets, and the problem is how, do you, uh, how are you sure that they will get together well in the end? So uh, first, we, the, the people were doing some kind of V-ray, uh, just uh, rendering just so that we get an idea of how it would look like. But quickly, we were working on something which is called a, which is called a look dev. So it's a place, it's a common place where you will put the assets, put them into different environments, and verify that the assets are behaving correctly with the different lightings. Um, and in this case, we use Marmoset Toolback for that. Uh, but we, uh, we have developed uh, a, a look dev tool in Unity uh, since then, which is available in uh, Unity 5.5, um, and which is experimental right now. And because you need some HDRI for this, we also delivered a free package of HDRI. So I will just show this to you. So it looks like this. Um, so you can just drag and drop things. You have a split view to verify that it's different. Uh, you have a Unite simulator um, here, so that you feel like you're at, <laughs> at Unite. Um, yeah, and you can, you can make it turn around. Uh, make everything turn around. It's pretty nice. Uh, you can impress your, your mother with that. Um, yeah, and enable shadows and, and so on. So you can try it now. So back to the presentation. Uh, we also had to develop a few features for, for, this, um, for this demonstration. So we had custom plane reflections. So for the, uh, the, the exit uh, for the walls on the corridor, and also for the moment that where he's uh, looking at himself on the ground. They were actually already developed uh, for, for Blacksmith, so it's a kind of uh, same version of Blacksmith. It's available on the, on the on, uh, environment package. Same thing for the outdoor puddles. Um, two things that we are not shipping. We developed a transparency shader, but it's not totally OK, so we didn't want to put it out now and maintain something which we're not sure about. And also, we customized the standard shader. Uh, what did we do? You have to, I think with this projector, we won't see much of a difference. But when, you do, when you're doing a, um, a movie, you want to really have control on everything per shot. Uh, sometimes you just want the trousers to be a bit brighter and, and the chest a bit darker or, or so, and so on. So we actually um, just exp uh, added some parameters to boost the contribution of light probes so that the plastic can... Can you see if... Uh, yeah, we don't see anything here. You see the trousers? This is uh, important for some people making film. Um, and the chest, we can boost the reflection probes on the top, you see, just so that you can just boost a bit things uh, independently. And we were actually changing this, um, this boost uh, for each um, shot. Also, we developed uh, a Pervertex baked ambient occlusion so that we have a better ambient occlusion. We didn't ship it, neither, because it's, it's kind of all right. The, the atmosphere is quite dark and doesn't make a big difference. And you have to change all your shaders to use that. So. But you can do it yourself. You know, you have the source code of uh, the standard shader for uh, Unity. So you can do this um, yourself if you want. And, and really, I recommend doing this if you need um, a strong
control. So this is a scene that we will try to reproduce right now. And we will have to go to the setup. First thing, uh, in Adam, we use quite a lot of uh, multi-scene editing also. So we had uh, scenes per locations so that people can work on the, on the scenes independently. And we had one scene with all the logic, all the cinematic, all the different shots. So there so are game objects with shot one, shot two, shot three, and so on, and with cameras and things which are different from one shot to another one. So first thing to set up is to choose between linear and gamma. I just want to have an idea here. Who knows what is the difference between linear and gamma, and who knows exactly why? No, OK, not exactly because there are not enough people. Who knows kind of why? <laughs> OK, half of people. So it's good. I, I didn't prepare these slides for nothing. So I hope that you will remember that. Um, so here is the difference. There is one which is linear and one which is gamma. So who thinks that the top uh, ball is lit in a more photorealistic way? The top ball. OK. Top ball, three people. And the bottom one, just to see if people don't pay. OK. So there are a lot of people who are not sure. Um, so the answer is something, a photo I took yesterday morning uh, in my room. You see, it's the top one, actually. The most photorealistic one is the top one. Um, and uh, yeah, and it comes, I will skip this because it's a bit complicated, but like, this gamma and linear rendering pipeline, you have a very good uh, talk by uh, John Habel um, about this. But basically, it comes from the fact that we had CRTs. And when you, put, when, you dub, when you were doubling the intensity on the CRTs, the luminosity was not doubling up. So you have this kind of curve, uh, this gamma curve. And even now, if, who has a CRT at home still using it? OK, nobody. But it's still, even LCD monitors are still using the, the, the gamma curve even if they can uh, answer uh, linearly. And also because of JPEG, uh, of all the compressions, because our eyes don't see so well the, the, um, uh, the dark colors. So we, we made a bigger range, you see, uh, here. If you, are, if you are, have a very dark color, you have uh, from 0 to, to 0 0.5. You can go to 0 0.7 being to, to reach the middle gray. Uh, instead of having just 0 0.5 to reach the middle gray. So you have from 0 to 0 0.7 to play with dark colors. But the problem with this is it's OK. Like, your camera is in linear, like, in, is in gamma. Like, your, every picture you have on your computer are probably in gamma. And all your screens are in gamma. The problem comes when you start mixing things and applying equations and multiplying. The problem is that because you have such a small range for the brightness, uh, you will lose all the. You will very quickly lose all the highlights because you have only a few few values to manage the very uh, bright colors, and you will also have this gradient color. You won't be able to have something which is very bright and very dark close to each other. It will just go smoothly. Um, it has a cost, and it's not available on every platform, uh, mostly on desktop and consoles. Uh, but we're working on uh, having it on on a mobile. Actually, it should come uh, quite soon. 5.5 or 5.6. Um, but yeah, you, it has a price because you have to convert from gamma to linear, do your lighting in linear, then convert back to gamma, and then sh present it to the screen. So I will, um, and the second thing, OK, sorry. Um, the second thing is to use deferred rendering. So let's go into um, Unity actually to show that. So let's put um, the player settings, which are on the other screen. OK. So let's go in linear. You will see that it lights up because we, we have this range which was pushed to the uh, uh, darker. And we use deferred. So what is deferred? Just to have a, a quick idea of what it is, uh, we will just uh, create a new scene to work today. OK. OK, we will remove this directional light. Uh, do we see something? No. OK, and let's move up. OK, so uh, we can even put it there. OK, so 
you, you have the debugger in Unity, which is quite nice to, to understand, the frame debugger, which is quite nice to understand what happens. So you will see here, uh, I'm not in, 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 in deferred, what happened? Okay, 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 sorry. Um, mm -hmm. Okay, here it is. So you see that we are doing something which is called um, uh, a f oops, sorry, it's here. We are doing something which is called the G buffer. The G buffer is is uh, is a storage of every uh, information that you need to do the lighting. You don't do yeah, you render your entire scene and you do the lighting after, like you would do in in Nuke or any post effects in in the movie industry sometimes. Uh, so. We store in different render targets everything you need to do the lighting. So for example, uh, we store the diffuse on the first render target, the specular um, and metallic uh, on the RT1, the normals on RT2, and the depths, and so on, and so on. And then you have a final pass where you actually do the, the lighting. So, and this is quite nice, because it allows you to do many things. Like, because you do the lighting after, you have many informations in the G buffer. So if you want to do screen space ambient occlusion, you just don't have the, the shape of the objects, but you also have the normals because you have them already on the G buffer. Uh, you can do screen space on uh, ray trace reflections. And also because the lighting is already done at the end, you can also do a lot of great things like area lights at real time and tube lights and all the volumetric fog. So you need to be set up as deferred. And the last thing you need to do is to set up your camera in HD, uh, because you will have some, some bending if you don't. Uh, I will show you that quickly. So if we, if we put a small light here. Uh, OK. Just again. OK, let's put that on the bottom. All right. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. What happens? OK, I have the frame debugger on. That's why. OK. So we just need to uh, don't use the skybox right now to, to do the lighting. OK. So, if I put a, a plane on the ground, you see this kind of bending. I will, I will just put the lighting a bit lower. Um, uh, it's very hard to see on this, on, this, uh, on this screen, but you see some bendings happening here because you don't have enough resolution, uh, resolution with an LD camera. So, we just go to... Uh, HDR, and then it should diminish the, the lighting, the, the bending a lot. Okay, I'll just remove that. Uh, don't forget also to when you uh, work in multi scene, don't forget to um, to uh, change your active scene when you create new objects. And because that's not that's what I forgot. Okay, so it's good. So now we are almost set up. We just need one more thing to start working, is a character. So uh, the original character of Adam was a generic character. It was not even a humanoid uh, kind of rig, because it was very mechanical, and we iterated a, bit, a lot on this. Um, but when we started to work on the packages, we thought nobody could use these kind of uh, characters, because you would have to animate it by hand and so on. So in the packages, you have actually a, a humanoid uh, character which is compatible with Mechanim, which allows to do retargeting and high key. So you will see here, we just, uh, you just take the Adam character, put it on the scene here. And, since, uh, and then you just need two things. The first thing is you need to create um, an animation controller. and put it into Adam. 
And so the animation controller is just a state animation state machine. Uh, we will just add an, an animation. So we provide uh, Adam with just one animation in our package, which is the Adam walk. Adam walk. So if we look here, we should see Adam walking. You can put any animation, like if you take anything from, uh, from for example, the standard asset, uh, an idle position or whatever, it will start using this animation. So it's pretty nice. You can make him dance and so on. So you have uh, Adam walking. And to start using uh, inverse kinematic, you just have to go uh, here and click I key pass. And this will you make an I key pass so that you can use inverse kinematic so that you can control the character. And here, finally, we will just uh, add a script that I found on our forums, which is uh, in editor I key. And this is quite nice because it auto generates um, I key goals. You see them here? And I will move them into, into Adam. So it, gener it auto generates I key goals. And if I just enable I key, and for example, I want to control the the right hand position. I just put the weight to one. I just grab the right hand goal, and here I can I can control the character. And this this is a way you can do a lot of posing. And it's quite nice because if you're working on a previs of a cinematic and you have the animation which are not ready, it's a very nice way to 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 start working. Um, so, and even it even works with the animation. So if I play. We will see him going away and keeping his, his arms like this. So um, that's where I will steal the, the posing, so, because it's too boring to see somebody pose something. So this is Adam. And now we have, we have the pose that I recreated, which is quite funny, because I don't use all the, all the keys. So it's kind of, if you want, you can kind of move based on this position. Uh, no, it, it doesn't move because it doesn't use the same uh, animation controller as before. So if I use the Adam one, it will, it will try to still play the walking animation on top of the I key. So let's see that. Yeah. So, sorry? Too, too large? Sorry? Too dark. Too dark. Ah. Uh, ah, yeah, true. I will put some lights on later on. Um, so uh, I will also just put the camera exactly in the same place as uh, we, um, we had it on the shot. So it takes two seconds. OK. And I will just copy the position here. Okay. Okay. So now we should have something very dark, of course, um, as you, you you say that. It's very true. And we reset it, and we are at the right place uh, compared to the beginning. So okay, I'm done. That's uh, you have the, the Adam style. Uh, I hope you're happy. Uh, no, I I still have to do some stuff. It, it looks very bad, right? Um, so we have our HDR camera. We have Adam. And now we will go to the FX side. So we, we use many, uh, many FX, but mostly it's, it was quite easy, like part, some particles effect to do the smoke in the entire. Um, and uh, we use volumetric uh, fog, which is giving this nice result. And we, I will go into details about this later on. We didn't use light shaft, but I just put it here because it's a nice alternative to volumetric fog, if you're looking at this. Uh, atmospheric scattering, it's, it's also a, a better version of the atmospheric scattering that we use on Blacksmith. And it's also available on the environment packages. And we also use a lot of simulation. Uh, one simulation is doing the simulation in, in like 3ds Max and importing it uh, as an alambic, with using the alab alambic importer that we developed for, uh, for the short it's a GIF from Mars Animation, so it's open source. You can use it. And we also use um, an asset on the asset store called Carante FX, which is a, um, a physically realistic simulation engine. 
And that's how we simulated all the, all the wires. And they have this, like this software, which is on behind uh, current FX, is used for simulation of destructions and uh, in movies and also in architecture. Um, and they have made a, a, an asset store plugin for $95 uh, to simulate uh, crazy things. So all, when, when the soldiers are shot, shooting on the ground, the simulation of the, of the fracture is done with current FX. Also, and all the clothes, all the clothing animation except the feather, the feathers, uh, are done also in current FX. So you just put things, you just decide how rigid they are, and current FX simulate it and bake it into an animation, and you just replay it. So it's not interactive, but it's physically rea realistic. So um, for the FX particles, we mostly one, what we did here is to simulate. Uh, the, the smoke in Houdini, and then uh, put it into um, a particle system. So we just do a very quick setup so, so that you have an idea. Um, this morning we presented uh, our new uh, image sequencer tool, which is exactly made to work on these flipbook images, which are making these very nice effects that we started working on during the Adam demo because it was not very convenient to not have it. So. Um, I will try to do this very quick. So let's just create a, a particle system. We, we just need a new, um, a new material for the particles, so, which is um, using the particles uh, alpha blend. And we just take the smoke. Uh, and it's, you don't see it, but it's here. Um, it's, it's an 8 by 16 um, uh, map, flipbook. And when you are done with this, you just um, drag and drop that here. And then you have a beautiful um, uh, animation that you, you just need to specify what is the size of the fli flipbook here. Now we see that it's a bit too fast, so um, we will just make it a lot more slower. Okay, now it looks like something. Is uh, Adam is on fire? Um, we will make it smaller also. Obviously, uh, the, the, the emission shape is too big. Uh, is too big. So let's use a box instead and make it very small. Okay, here. Okay, and we already have something something quite good. We will just, there are just too many of them to be realistic. Now here, the problem that we have is that it's, it's, we see it popping a lot. So what we will do is just um, change the color of a lifetime. So because we see it popping because um, we, it's, it's not alpha blended at the beginning and at the end. So I just use this, go at the beginning, um, send alpha to zero. I just add an alpha in the middle. I will add another one so that you have this kind of curve where it stays alpha, and then go back to, uh, to blended. And you see that there is no, no popping anymore. It, it looks very smooth now. Um, we can add some rotations also uh, so that we have this kind of smoky effects. So they need to, to, to go into two directions. So we will actually say I want to go um, random between I don't know, minus 20 and, and 20. And now you have this kind of turning around effects. Um, and this is basically, it. there are some more parameters, but uh, you have done, you have seen how in three minutes we can, you can start doing some quite nice uh, particle effects, uh, especially with a new tool where you will be able to very quickly generate the, the flip books. It's, it's going to be very, very nice. So same thing, uh, mine is probably not as good as the one that I prepared before, so I will just uh, replace it with, um, with good ones. So we have three of them in Adam. We have two on the sides uh, on, this sh on this particular shot. So we have two um, on, the, on the left and on, on the right of the, of the room, of the door, sorry. And we have one big here which will uh, play around with the fog. Uh, yeah, can you see that? Yeah. Okay, so we are done with FX. 
Now we will go uh, to lighting. So the lighting becomes more and more complicated somehow, because uh, when, I, when I started 15 years ago, I, I almost had only ambient and directional to manage, uh, to have just like a directional light and a point light. And, uh, but now it's, it's becoming very complicated, so that you have ambient lighting, then you have the direct lighting, which can be a point light and directional light, a spot light, but also now you have uh, real-time area lights, and you have real-time tube lights. Then you have indirect lighting, which could be the light maps. So you bake the global illumination into light maps. You can bake the global illumination into light probes. And you have reflection probes, which are here to reflect the, the surrounding of a PBR material. Um, in Adam, we didn't use light maps. No light maps were hurt, and no lighter were hurt, was hurt neither, uh, because it's very long to bake. Uh, we, you all know that. Um, and actually, when you have something very metallic or something very wet, like what we have on, on Adam, you don't really need uh, the light maps. So for indirect lighting, we only used reflection probes. And we had only a few um, uh, light probes uh, in the corridor so that it really lights the character when it goes through this. And some light probes out in the outdoor also. Um, and then you add shadows on top of this, and then you add post effects, so you have the volumetric fog and so on. So when you do your lighting, you have to ask yourself many questions, like how much will, will I want the di direct lighting to be? Because on top of this, there will be the lighting of the fog. Um, there will be a different range on the fog or on the light. Um, when, you have, when you have added the light, the, the, the uh, the contribution of the light will appear on the reflection probe, so you have to rebake your reflection probes in the meantime. So you have to think about all of this, but, but we can do it. So let's, uh, let's go. So first, ambient lighting is the easiest one. Um, this is something also I've seen uh, doing some consultancy or training. Uh, some people forgot uh, the fact that the ambient source is coming from the skybox. So for example, sometimes you feel like all your all your level is blue. It's because just you didn't bake any reflection probe, and by default, it reflects the, the, the sky. So when you're do working in an interior demo, don't forget to turn off the, the sky box and all these things, because the day you will turn it off, everything will go down less blue. And uh, it's a bit, yeah, then you need the sky box to ship. Um, so here we have uh, a very a very uh, subtle uh, ambient lighting. It's a bit, it's a bit bluish, just to simulate the fact that that um, you have the lights coming out from outside from the from the natural light. Uh, you, we actually don't really need it. The computer, the screen is going away. Um, so we have this. We will remove our point light. Actually, we will transform it first into. Um, oh, we will first do the, the reflection probes. So let's do the reflection probes because we always forget forgot them. So we had in Adam we had four reflection probes on the interior, um, one in the middle, two on the sides, and um, and another one in the corridor. Um, we put two on the sides so that you have nice specular reflections because we we had some lights on the side and we wanted to have the nice specular reflections on the side. Um, but it could also almost work with just one uh, reflection probe. When you have a reflection probe, you, uh, you have to choose also between box projection or not box projection. So if you have a box, you use a box. If you have a character or if you're outdoor, you, use, you don't use a box. Um, there are some shots also where we wanted to have very, like when it's very reflective on the head of Adam. So in these particular shots, we added a, a reflection probe very close to the, to the character. Um, and so that it doesn't blend with the other ones, because by default, the reflection probes are blending, uh, you have to put the blend distance to zero if you want to override the fact that you just use one uh, reflection probe at the time. So, uh, and then you have two choices using the auto mode, like this, and it will just comp automatically compute the reflection probes on the go. And yeah, here it's done. So we, we, can, we can visualize it. Yeah. And um, okay, so let's continue. So this point light. So you have two choices. Uh, to let's go back to the to the reference image. Um, 
So we have done reflection probes. And now you need to add the fog. So until the uh, Adam demo release, you, you could do it this way, uh, which I wanted to present. And it's, uh, it's just using a spotlight. So you can create kind of the same, the same atmosphere um, here. We can rotate it a bit. Okay. We can uh, put the biggest angle. And then if you, if, you go, if you type Robert and light shaft, you will find the GitHub uh, about the light shaft. And you will get this uh, folder. And all you need to do is just to drag and drop the light shaft on top of it. And then you had some fog. Um, so we, we can just adjust this to be smaller. And, uh, da, da, da. and we will diminish the range a bit. Okay. So you have already a kind of volumetric lighting, which is pretty cheap, actually. Um, what is nice with the, with the light shaft, you can use a color one. So the, the light which is coming from outside, as I, as I said earlier, is, is bluish. So we, we will make it a bit blue. Don't count too much on, on the color grading. Just think of the colors as they should be. Um, so we can make it bluish. And also, we can, we can separate the, the brightness of the, of the light shaft from the brightness of the spot. And we have also an attenuation curve. If we look at the reference image, we see that the, it's very bright here, and it's going away, which is called usually anisotropy. But you can simulate this with, an, with a curve, which is always on the wrong screen. So you just, uh, you just do this, and it will just diminish Get a bit stronger. Ah, too much. Yeah, that's it. So, yeah, it's cool. We already have something. Also, it takes uh, shadows, so it's, uh, we can even have some, just achieve a bit better effect. Yeah, cool. So we, we have almost something which looks like Adam, but it's not the way we, we made it, so I just remove everything. So, um, what we have in Adam is, is a screen space volumetric fog. So naturally, we put it on the camera. So we just add the volumetric fog component here. And, uh, and the volumetric fog behaves exactly as you expected at the beginning. So if you put, a, like, the numbers are a bit uh, uh, guesstimate. But. So the more you have fog, uh, the more it's black. Because right now, there is no light lighting the fog. So um, it just prevents the lighting to go to you. So that's why it's, it's just totally black at the beginning. Sometimes, naturally, you would like to put fog and it's white, but there is no reason the, to the fog to be white if, if there is no light on it. And then, so the constant fog is the fog which is uh, everywhere. And then you have the hate fog, which goal is usually to say, I want like this very nice fog on a Michael Jackson concert uh, until here. So, what you do here is, so it's an exponential value, which is ruling the, the, the fog. So what you will do is the offset kind of represents uh, the thickness of the fog. And um, the, um, the uh, exponent represents how fast it, it, uh, the, the density goes down through this area, um, which means that if you put it negative, Actually, you can have fog on the top going down. And, and it's what we use in, in Adam. So you add some amount of, of, um, of fog. And I will put like one meter here. And I put minus three. And you don't see anything because uh, the, um, the projector is too dark. So I will put one light to light it. So we will use area lights, which are uh, the, the new great thing. So we have this area light, and I will just spend some time. So usually in video games, it's very new to work with area light, because uh, in video games, we always have point lights. And if you don't have point lights, uh, they are baked. 
uh, um, point lights don't uh, they don't exist in uh, real life like there is nothing which is infinitely s small so we always we are always faking the fact that it's that it's not uh, a point so when we have the specular highlight we just make it bigger faking it to be bigger but if you want to have like if you look in the eyes of somebody with a very nice photography and you have a light you will always have it a bit square and not not a small dot um, so here we have um, we have uh, our um, area light. And you see that my point was to light the fog, and it doesn't light the fog. Um, which is, and, and still, the, the, the area lights in Adams, they have a fog light by default. So if you want to light the fog, you need a fog light. But you need something else. You need uh, a light manager. I love managers. So when, probably when we, when we integrate this in Unity, we, don't, we won't need light managers anymore. So now we have a light manager. We have a light fog on the, on the area light. And now we have a fog which is lit, and we can continue trying to customize it. So first, I will use a real area light placed uh, at the right place, um, which will be this one. So I just remove the one here and turn on this one. Oh, what did I do? I, I removed the manager. OK. So remove this one and turn on this one. So the, the area light is placed behind the, the things here. So we, we need to set up a bit better the, the fog. So uh, the first thing is, is we have a big range here. We are going to uh, 0 0.1 meter from the, from the area light until 100 meters, which means that the, the shadows are very, very sharp at the beginning because you have this huge range. So we will diminish uh, the range, and it should already behave a bit, a bit better. Um, then what is nice with our volumetric fog is that we, since it's, it's done uh, uh, in screen space, you can do some funky stuff on it. Uh, like uh, having noise in it and having even animated noise. So we can add some, some noise. And we can add anisotropy. So anisotropy is the fact that the further um, the light goes through the fog, the less you have lights going uh, forward. So if we put it here, we will see that it's just um, going down. We can also, yeah, so it's, it's pretty all right. It's very dark, this screen. <laughs> Uh, you're right. So OK, so it's, that's a good point of doing the lighting uh, real time, is that we can actually multiply the intensity. So it looks a bit better. It's a bit saturated now. Mm -hmm. OK. So um, now we, we have one lighting. And if we go back to the reference shot, we have something else, which, is the tube, which are the tube lights. So right now, what you would do is just put an emissive material and put bloom so that you feel like it's glowing, and just put point, li point lights around so that it's putting some light. But uh, in Adam, we have something which is better than this, which are tube lights. So here, you put the tube light on. And so we will make a, a very realistic tube light of 1.5 meter here. Yeah. And you have this very, very nice lighting. So one thing to note that I didn't say before, the fact is that the tube lights, they cannot cast shadows, because they are diffusing the light on the surface, but on the cylinder. And it would be a bit complicated to, uh, to cast shadows. Um, but the area light in, uh, in Adam, they can, they can cast shadows, which is pretty nice, because it makes a, a big difference. Um, yeah, you see it. Actually, they, shouldn't cast, they should not cast shadow. The one that I put should cast shadow. Um, for the tube lights, same stuff. I will, uh, I will just use mine that, I, that I've placed at the right place. So they are here. And we have uh, 15 minutes to go. We are not totally at the Adam look style. So we have three tube lights on the ceiling here. 
And we have two tube lights near the door on the right and on the left, which are red. And these tube lights here, oh, it's so dark. Um, maybe can we turn off the, uh, the lights on the, on the audience? Maybe it would help. Is it possible? And can we put more bass also? <laughs> OK, cool. Um, so let's imagine it's better. And uh, so yeah, so we have, uh, just to, to see the setup, um, we have something which is quite intense for a light, which is 0 0.4 on a scale of 1. Uh, but with a very small range, because we really want to light the walls so that you can really see the, the frame of the, of the door. Uh, but on the fog light, you see it here, we have an intensity multiplier of 0 0.03, which means that we really want to be not too light, too lit, but we have a big range, because we want the, the light to feel like they, it's, go, it's lighting this entire area on the, on the side. And for the, for the lights on the top, we also want to light the... Um, uh, the ceiling. So for this, we just add uh, what something we can do is to add a tube light with a fog light. But if you click on force on fog here, you don't even need uh, the tube light, and it just lights uh, just lights the fog. So so that you don't pay the the cost of like one uh, fog light for each uh, neon, because anyway the fog light is quite diffuse and low frequency, so uh, you don't need it so much. And, uh, and we are almost here. So it's, it's a very dark version of, of Adam. Oh, maybe because uh, I, should have, um, I should have baked my reflection probe. Uh, but I'm in auto. OK. Let's try. Should have something a bit better. OK. Wow. Fantastic. <laughs> so. Um, so we have, we, but we can do something, actually, because I'm, I'm done with the lighting. But we can do something now, which is the makeup of, uh, the makeup of games and, and films. So this is everything we've done, the, um, the lights, the tube lights. And um, now the post effects. Post effects will maybe save me. <laughs> so. Um, Originally, this, to this talk was supposed to be four hours long, just because of that. Uh, because because we, th when we used the post effects of Adam, um, we had to use a bunch of different things. I don't know, just to make a very quick uh, poll. So who is using post effects on their project? OK, half of the people. OK, on the half of the people, are you using the standard assets to, for your post effects? Who is using standard assets? OK, one, two, OK. Who is using the cinematic post effects on Bitbucket? Yes, two, five, ten. Who is using um, post effects from the asset store? Probably. Uh, OK, some. Who is using the TAA branch from the Bitbucket? No, I'm joking. But it's, it's a real one. Um, so we exactly had this issue. Uh, we had to pick. Post effects a bit everywhere, standard assets, uh, Bitbucket, the TAA branch of the Bitbucket, uh, some stuff from the asset store, and so on. We also had to care about the order, which is quite hard to get. So I won't go through that because I don't have time. But we, I, that's what I would have had to explain before. But since two weeks, we have something fantastic. Uh, it's on GitHub uh, Unity Post Processing. Uh, you can download it now and since already two weeks. It's a uber post-processing effect. So, and it's, it's very magical. You've seen it already this morning. I wish I, I could have done my talk before the keynote, but it was hard. Um, so, to do, to do post-processing now in Unity, it's, it's crazy easy. So you just create a, a post-processing profile. And uh, unite shut 14. You go to your camera, and no, not this one. Where is my fog? Oh, OK. Here. You just add a, a post-processing behavior. We will put it just before the, what? No. <laughs> move up. OK. And we will just move it here. And now you're done with 
setting up your post-processing effects, you can just start uh, playing around with them. So let's see. You want anti-aliasing, you just click it. We have two anti-aliasing, a super mega fast and a super, super fast. Uh, the super mega fast is really for low end and some VR things. Um, and, but we have the temporal anti-aliasing, which costs about, on Viking Village, 0 0.8 milliseconds on PS4. So it's pretty, it's pretty hard to, to, to beat that for anti-aliasing. Also, you have to note that um, in the quality settings, you have to disable uh, anti-aliasing uh, to make it work. Uh, okay. So we can add ambient occlusion if I see the game. So what I will do directly, because to save my, I hope that it will save me, is to use color grading and do overexposure. Yeah. It's <laughs> good. So now I can play around. Um, so you can, you can add some ambient occlusion. As we said, it's very good for this kind of interior to have a strong ambient occlusion. So you just, you just crank it up. Uh, it's a bit too overexposed now, but yeah. Um, then you can add screen space reflection. Do you see this on the ground? Yeah. You see the difference it makes, right? Um, then you can add, we can add a bit of bloom. So probably with this exposure, we don't see it a lot, but I will just crank it up also. Uh, yeah. So normally, when you, when you work on a normal screen, uh, you, you just keep a very low uh, level of bloom so that you don't see it, but you just have this feeling that the light is, is glowing a bit around. You, you, you don't have to see it like in Superman. Or, um, and then we will do the color grading. So that's where you, you need to look at the reference image. Uh, so it could be a movie for you and so on. So you look at this, and the first thing you see is like the contrast is a lot stronger. So here we have two tone mappers. So the tone mapper is to go from HD to LD. And you either go naturally from one to another, either you go um, with some already some predefined setup. And there is a filmic one, which is putting directly a very strong contrast. So I use this one. Um, and you have directly a strong contrast. And then once you're, you're there, the second question you have to ask yourself is, is my, I will actually decrease the exposure a bit because it's ugly. OK. Maybe uh, I should add um, an extra light somewhere. I will just add the one light to, to make it better. I have seven minutes to go. Sorry? Oh, yeah, true. That's a good, uh, that's a good, uh, thanks for that. Okay. Yeah. Is it better? Oh, it's better. Thanks. <laughs> um, so the second question you have to ask yourself is, is it, uh, is it warmer or colder? So here you can see that it's a bit warm, uh, the atmosphere. Even if it's greenish, it's warm. So you just put the temperature a bit warmer. So not too much. You see that it would be very, very warm. But here you just put it slightly warmer. And then the second question is, what is the tint, the global tint? And here you can see that the tint is kind of greenish. So we just shift the tint a bit so until we have this kind of greenish look. OK. It's a bit green. Um, then we have the saturation of colors. We see that the orange is quite saturated and the blue is quite saturated. So same stuff. If we crank it up, we will have the orange very orange. So too orange is bad. Um, here. And it's quite saturated. And then we can see that the global contrast is there is not so much contrast, actually. Like the black are quite black, but the global image is not so contrasted, so I just diminish a bit the contrast. OK. And I think we can have, we kind of have the, the Adam look. Um, and yeah, and it's pretty cool. And on the, um, you also have to help you uh, many, many controls uh, for, uh, um, which are very beautiful, actually. Woo. And this one is nice also. And yeah, people who do color grading probably understand uh, better. So that's uh, the idea. You can also use a custom LUT, a lookup table, if you want to import it from uh, an, an external software. For example, in the original Adam demo, 
uh, they didn't really do the color grading. They used um, lookup tables, which were corresponding to real uh, films, uh, camera films, and, uh, and so on. So this is the way you can use them. Also, they use a bit of chromatic aberration, so that you have this kind of filmic feeling. So if you put it too much, you see that you have this too much chromatic aberration, but just a bit of it kind of gives this feeling. They, had a, they added a grain also. Same thing, if you add too much, it's bad, but if you add a bit, you have the, the feeling that it's a real uh, camera, um, camera film. And some vignetting on top of it. Again, uh, if we put too much, it looks like the end of a, of a talk. Uh, but just a, a bit of it is, is quite nice. So OK, that's, uh, that's, it for, uh, that's it for the setup. So just to, to finish quickly, I have four minutes left. Uh, we, this kind of job of lighting and placing and posing and things like this, we did it uh, at each, almost at each shot in Adam, all, all this on the timeline. So for example, on this shot, we, we, have, we have used a fog ellipsoid, which is an, uh, a way to override the fog in a particular area. So we have diminished the global fog, and then we have pushed the fog ellipsoid so that we can control the fog on this particular shot. And all this is switching at real time uh, in one single frame. So you can actually run the entire uh, movie all along, even if everything is switching, lights are changing places, and so on. But you don't have a pop-up uh, a, a pop of something. We uh, also use uh, another area lights which were not rendered on top of, um, of Adam so that you can have this nice rim lighting. And also we added a monitor light. You see, because when it's like this, we only have lights coming from the window, so normally it's totally dark. So the monitor was quite a nice uh, thing. Actually, I will turn it on also. I have already added it. So here, if I go to, if I select Adam, okay, if I go to the monitor, I actually placed already a tube light here. And if we go there, and we turn on the lighting, uh, and we turn on the tube light, probably you don't see it on the screen like always, but yeah, you can see it's a, it's a bit bluish. So we have done this. On this shot particularly, we kind of use the same technique. We just added something that I didn't talk about before, is the spotlight. So we added a, a small spotlight just to make the, the light on the eyes with using a mask. So you can cast the spotlight only on the eyes and not on nothing else. So you can really control the, the eyes. And, uh, and so on and so on. So a lot of people also told me, yeah, but it's, it's, it's good for, it's good, like it's a movie, but it's not good for moving around. So the, uh, the idea is to finish this talk is just to add a first person controller and try to uh, walk around uh, this place. So, okay, it's here. So probably I will have to reuse my my color grading, my overexposed color grading. Oh, it's, it's quite overexposed already. OK. So maybe I have to rebake the. OK. Ooh. Woo. <laughs> OK. <laughs> So that's, uh, that's the first time since I prepare my demo, it happens, I swear. So, um, OK, I try just once. And if it doesn't, I, I will leave you go to the next talk. So let, give me two seconds. I just wanted to show you that it's running actually real time on a MacBook Pro 2014. Uh, OK. But yeah, I, ju I just my, my, my conclusion. So my conclusion is. You can grab the assets. You can grab the new post effects. Um, you can grab the light shaft. And you can start making your own Adam movie. You have now the, all the volumetric lighting tools in your hands. You know how to use them after this hour. And uh, I hope you can make good films, cinematics, movies, games, and so on. Um, and uh, yeah, thanks for listening and following and laughing <laughs> sometimes. Thank you.